All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Stuart. Uh, my name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the Swiss Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Stuart Elliott accepted our invitation to our show. Stuart, welcome to the show, man. Claudia. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, this has been a, a very weird period for everybody in the last two years with the pandemic. Uh, how the pandemic yeah. affected you, your life, your inability to tour, your sanity? How are you holding up, man? <laughs> Uh, yeah, all of those things. It's, yeah, it's affected all of those things. Um, I remember that when it when it fir the first um, lockdown that we had, um, the weather here was just beautiful. It was fantastic weather in March, mm -hmm. which would normally be a little bit chilly, but it was just like blazing hot, sunny every day for like three months. You know, yeah. so the first the first lockdown was was actually a lot of fun because um, I I did a lot of writing uh, in my studio. Uh, I think I wrote about 33 tracks for um, production music, you know, library music. Got it. So uh, it was a very creative time. And then in between that, I was sort of um, putting up new fencing in the garden in the sun and getting a tan. And it was fantastic. Um, but then as the sort of winter started approaching and we had another lockdown and then another lockdown in, in right in the winter, it started to get to me. Um, and I'm still a little affected by it now. It sort of knocked knocked the wind out of my sails in a lot of ways. And I, th I think it probably did that to everybody. You just get so fed up being restricted to have social contact. And not that I, I didn't, you, you, I don't really have a lot of social contact anyway, but having none was, was a real problem. Um, and my father at the time was uh, 97 years old. Um, and he was just very frail, needed needed help. And for a few months, I, I couldn't. I wasn't even allowed to go and see him. It was it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Very stressful. Um, but um, now that it's over, you know, we're sort of slowly getting back in, in into things. Um, but it hasn't picked up as quickly as I'd like. Um, it would have been it would have been a lot more um, fruitful uh, work wise if um, Steve Harley had gone out with the full band because he's done a lot he's done a lot of gigs like he did a lot of shows last year um but they were all acoustic just acoustic with a you know no drums so um th th i could have done with going out for a while to play because because it, it sort of it's you know f for me playing live is like a sort of um it's like therapeutic it's like a healing thing for me when i play drums at an audience and a bit of a sweat you know come yeah. off stage to great applause it, it yeah lifts your spirits you know so um We'll be doing more of that in December, so um, maybe the healing will begin then. But um, it's Good been quite, you. yeah, it's been quite quite a, a blank sort of uh, period where you know the spirits get a bit low, and uh, you have to keep motivating yourself every day to sort of do stuff, you know. But um, it, everything's good now, though. Yeah, um, I'm glad that you you say that you like that music. For me, I, I live in the border with two different states, with Maryland and Washington D.C. And Virginia, yeah. so I'm able to see, I don't know, bet between 40 and 50 shows a year. So I'm I'm very lucky. Every band come here this way to Washington City. So, and right. live music is very important for me. I mean, it's I have a huge collection of music. You know, four floors full of music, and uh, but wow. seeing people playing live, it's it's amazing. I uh, it's like a ritual. Every time they go to a concert, it's it's amazing. So, so you must have been uh, you must have been affected quite negatively mentally but not being able to do that for two years uh, yeah we couldn't uh, here in washington dc we of course you know in the united states over a million people die and some people believe in the vaccine some people didn't and everything is slowed down i began working from home i'm a, I'm a computer scientist i mean music is my passion and yeah. uh, and uh, i open one radio i send the link to friends they like it, then I open another one, another send another link, and I thought, well, you know, if musicians are not touring, everybody must be at home boring, bored. So I, I began calling people, and uh, at the beginning, uh, nothing happened, and then eventually Steve Hackett get back to me. I was, he was my first interview, believe it or not. Um, oh, so you started doing the interviews but in in the during the pandemic? Correct. Yep. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good. That's a good way to get through it. Yeah, and I have done now. I don't know, two hundred fifty, three hundred, uh, and it's, um, I'm very lucky, you know. But uh, 
that I'm able to talk to great musicians, people who I, I admire for a long time that I have right. records. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a person who, who bought his first record, her record 30, 40 years ago. So I have, like, you can see a little bit on the back, but I have, I don't know, be, between CDs, vinyl, Blu-ray, I don't know, 7,000, for everything, your jazz rock, uh, electronic music, soundtrack. I have a wide range of stuff, you know, that I Right. Have. So you won't be uh, you won't be switching over to Spotify too soon then. No, no, no. I like physical. <laughs> things. No, yeah, no, I know. I, it's like a book, <laughs> right? I I don't like reading PDF. I need the whole thing. I yeah, open, that's right. You know, open up. Op, it's still the same. It, you know, the, the the beautiful thing about see, it's crazy with the guy because young kids, right? You know they. You know, they don't buy CD. They download stuff. They listen to 10 seconds or so. Next, next, next. That's a, that's that's right. a very stupid that. way to live your life. I don't want to live it. You know, with a vinyl, you, you open it up. You look at the picture. It smells great. You look at the other side. Who played that? You put one side. You listen to a couple of times. You go to the other side. And it, it are two different things. It's a, you know, it's a it's another ritual as you said um yeah, yeah, you know sitting yeah, yeah. sitting down to listen to music is something that i always did as, as a as a teenager and even yeah. up into my sort of 30s and and slightly beyond i would just you know when my wife was watching tv i'd be in the corner in the same room with the hi-fi system with my headphones on listening to all my favorite albums same same here uh, my, <laughs> my 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 dad i was born in chile and i came to united states to to study and um, my my dad had a huge amount of music, a lot, thousands. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, all jazz, you know, Kerry Roll Malt, Louis Armstrong, you know, and, and, and tango from Argentina. So I began listening to music when I was a baby, yeah. little, little bit. And then when I was 14 or so, I discovered genesis and peter gabriel and the rest is history and, you know i i thought man i i don't like the music that my play like that play but i like progressive rock and yeah. and, uh, and and the rest is you know history i'm, I'm being very lucky in, in, in my life that i have a lot of schooling i was like a scholar in many ways i have done well yeah. and that allowed me to travel to see band you know i i went to see the last shows of genesis uh, this year, oh, yeah, right, yeah. Years, went to see uh, Eric Clapton playing at the Royal Albert Hall again. So I'm very fortunate. So, and now I'm talking to you. <laughs> right. So for people that don't know, where you born? Like in a in a musical family? How old were you when you perhaps took you know guitar lesson, or piano lesson, or drum? How how the beginning? Yes. Of yeah, my father. My father was a drummer in in the big bands in the in the thirties, forties, fifties. Um, he used to be, uh, do you remember Lena Horn? Mm -hmm. He was her drummer when she came to Europe. Yeah. She used, she, she had her own band in, in America, but when she came to Europe, my dad was her drummer. Um, and after that, he, um, he sort of kind of did a lot of, he did a lot of, um, recording work. He did what they call broadcasts in those days. Most radio, most music was played on the radio and it was live music on the radio. So they'd always have a big band and they'd be playing music, um, reading music and just like for 45 minutes or, or a whole morning or whatever. Um, so he did broadcasts in the morning and in the evenings he'd be working in nightclubs. Uh, and then he, he ended up as uh, a resident drummer at the Savoy hotel in london and he was there for about oh comes 20 20 odd years um and then he finally retired when he was in his 60s um and he only died last year he was he, he, he lived until he was 98 and um wow. and there you go and he had a drum kit in his room right up to the end <laughs> good for you man. yeah good yeah for you. and then so what kind of what kind of music were you listening when you were i don't know 15 16 year old what kind of you well, listen? actually, but the, the first music I was introduced to would have been my dad's music, because um, yeah. he used to, he was just, uh, he was obsessed with um, um, all of his sort of, um, all of his peers at the time, and there was Duke Ellington, he, wow. he was, he loved Duke Ellington, um, and of course, you know, he was always playing Buddy Rich records, and um, uh, Dave Brubeck Quartet, 
And so I was kind of brought up on more jazz than anything up, up until up until I was, I think it was, I must have been about maybe nine, ten, something like that. And then the Beatles came out, yeah, and the Rolling Stones, wow. and that's that's where I switched. I thought, right, that's that's what I want to do. Now, I always wanted to play drums. I wanted to play drums, for, for, you know, since I was three. But I wasn't quite sure what kind of a drummer I would be. But then as soon as, you know, the, the Beatles and the Stones and the Who, um, two of which I actually worked with, you know, worked with two of the Beatles, you know, Paul and Ringo and um, and Roger Daltrey from the Who. So, you know, for me to, and Jack Bruce from Cream, I, I played with him and did some recording. And it's like all these these records that were the, the records I was listening to as a teenager all of a sudden i'm you know later in life i'm playing with those guys so it's like it's like it's like it's just like a dream come true that kind of thing but uh, in answer to your question as as a teenager yeah i was listening to the beatles my first single that i ever bought was she loves you um and the first album i ever bought was um please please me album the beatles first album yeah uh, and also i bought the, the uh the rolling stones first album um and after that, I bought Who's Next, which is Won't Get Fooled Again and all that stuff with The Who. I bought that as well. So, yeah, it was mainstream pop was and rock was my thing. Good for you, good for you. Have you ever looked back in your life and then I know, you know, we'll be talking to all the people you have played, but you say, what the heck, man? I was a little kid, a shy kid, and... You know, 50 years later, if I review your life, you have played with everybody, man. Amazing. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's over a long period of time. Um, I mean, I had a lot of periods in between where I'd be doing nothing for two months or, or a month here, a month there. Um, but, yeah, I do I do look back and I, 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 I it's, it's, it's all the most mixed feelings. I think, oh, my God, what if I hadn't had those introductions and if I hadn't met so-and-so I would have never have worked with all these others, you know, right, um, right. because it was all, I mean, Co being in Cockney Rebel was what got me into the music business. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, and that was a really lucky break because um, I, I was looking to join a band when I was a teenager um, and a friend of mine said, oh, I got a friend, a, a bass player that's looking for a, looking for a drummer. I can't remember what his name was, but I called him up. I says, oh, hi, uh, I believe you're looking for a drummer. He says, oh, I've got a drummer now. But um, my friend, I've got a friend, Steve, that's looking for a drummer, Steve Harley. So that was, you know, if I hadn't met Steve, Cockney Rebel wouldn't have happened I mean, well, with me in it anyway. Um, and then when I think what that what that led to is, uh, well, for, for one, Alan Parsons produced Cockney Rebel on two albums. And also Andrew Powell, who was the orchestral arranger, yeah. worked on both those albums as well. And it was Andrew Powell that got me the Kate Bush gig. My God. And it, and it was Alan that got me um, Year of the Cat. That's right. Alan Stewart. I mean, it's like this little family w was gave birth to a whole load of um, fantastic albums and artists that I worked with that then course you know then i met people on those sessions all the great musicians on those sessions and then that's where all the sort of cross fertilization and the and the networking took place um and you know you'd you do an album with like the album i did with um uh with kate bush um had uh, uh david payton and ian benson from pilot as well and it just so happened that uh, Stuart Tosh, who was in their band as well, was yeah. part of the original project band. Um, the first two albums, I, Robot and Tales of Mystery, was yeah. Stuart, Stuart Tosh on drums. But then he joined 10CC. And because yeah. I did that Kate Bush album with yeah. Ian and David, uh, uh, Ian and yeah. David, hmm. they, they said, oh, Alan's, Alan's looking for a new drummer. And Alan knew me anyway. So they said, oh, what about Stuart Elliott? We've had a great, did a great album with him. It'd be great for the project. So Alan said, right, okay. So I was in the project, you know. And it's like the family thing just grew and grew and grew. And that's mm -hmm. that's how it works. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Good, fantastic. Good for you. I interviewed uh, Dave Payton as well. And he's a very nice fellow. And, uh, I, you know, we um he's kind of 
you know, sick and um, I, he's not doing interviews, but I have met some of the people that he can play with and, uh, and I yeah. got to view with Alan Parsons. Well, great, great musician. I feel very fortunate myself as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are great people. I, I, I think one of your a reason where you one of the big influences were John Morello and Buddy Rich for you. Oh yeah, well both really. Um, yeah. I, I'm still inspired by both of them. Um, but I think I think in my in my my style of playing, there's a little bit more Joe Morello than there is Buddy. Yeah, uh, because he used to do all these sort of interesting sort of. Um, african type rhythms and things but not not overtly but um that kind of captivated me um and I, I remember um i thought nothing of it i didn't try and copy him ever 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 um but i listened to him and uh, i remember um i was doing a recording with steve harley this was in between bands we didn't have the old band and the new band hadn't been formed yet i think it was 1975 um, and it eventually got, uh, there's a song called Throw Your Soul Down Here, which is a B-side to Here Comes the Sun, I think. And I was in the studio with Steve and we had Herbie Flowers on upright bass and we had B.A. Robertson. Have you heard of him? No. Well, he was, he was he's called Brian Robertson then, but he became B.A. Robertson. And I played on, on a number one single of his later on, but he played piano. And we played this song and um, I did some drum fills at the end. And one of the drum fills that I played, B.A. B.A. Robertson said, "Ah, oh, Joe Morello. <laughs> and it was just a little thing that I did that I, I did it unconsciously, but it, it was very Joe Morello. And he noticed it. He, he, he knew what his playing was like and he noticed it. So I thought, you know, that's my, that there's an influence. You know, that's that's real influence when you do, you don't know something, you're doing something and, and someone else recognizes it. But uh, that kind of kind of tickled me. But, yeah, Joe Morello was one of my all time favorite drummers yeah good for you man yeah. and um also I, I noticed that you you admire as well ringo star you know in your opinion looking back what's your what's your opinion that that you that you have that you think he was a good drummer and and the, he was very influential for future generations right so oh my god yeah i i i only know one drummer that said he didn't like him i won't say really? who it was yeah, yeah, and he's a good drummer as well, this guy. But he said, nah, I never liked his playing. Um, but every other drummer I've ever known, and all the best drummers in the world, maybe not Buddy Rich because he didn't like anybody. <laughs> but, um, oh, we all love Ringo. Ringo is a fantastic drummer. I mean, it's very, um, it's very, uh, it's very subtle, the, the, the beautiful difference that he makes to those records. I mean, I can't think of one Beatles record where the drums weren't perfect. Because they were. They're just absolutely spot on with timing, groove, taste, creativity. Um, you know, one of the highlights of my life was, was playing live with him. Um, wow. we, did, uh, we did the Michael Jackson and Friends uh, show, which was a live uh, festival in Munich. Um, and we came on with Ringo. And we did, I think we only did two songs. I think it was just Yellow Submarine and a little help from my friends. Yeah. But I have to say, you know, I've always said that every drum fill that Ringo ever composed was like a little piece of music in itself. And yeah. it's just so beautiful. And that drum fill, you know, um, on Little Help from My Friends, where it goes just, just after the chorus, it's before it goes into the second verse, it goes, da 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 that fill is just one of the most incredible drum fills that I think has ever been written because it, it is a million things Ringo could have done there, but he did that and it just, it kept it moving. It's a bit like old forties drumming, you know, where Gene Krupa used to do the Tom Tom's boom, 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 boom. And it was just so, so beautiful and so musical that, I actually had shivers up my spine when I played it behind him. Really? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I'm gotten shivers now thinking about it because it's so, such a such a, a a musical little snippet of of drumming that doesn't interrupt the song, but it ties those two bits together beautifully. Ringo's Ringo did, did loads of that. I mean, it's, it's, oh, I can't I can't even begin to I can't don't know where to start. You know, it's just 
to say what a wonderful drummer he was. You listen to any anything they ever did, and it's just fantastic. Yeah, I never, I have never met any of the of the Beatles. I have seen Ringo Starr with his All Star Band many times, and here in in, in United States as well as Paul McCartney a couple of times. But uh, yeah, hey, hopefully I will. They probably will never give me an interview. But hey, if I can shake hands with the guy who take a picture one day. That, that's all I need. Uh, it, oh no, he wouldn't get an interview from Ringo. I think someone I know, else I know wanted to wanted to interview him, but no, he doesn't. He doesn't really do that. I think he'd, he'd do an interview on uh, mainstream American TV or something, you know. But, or, uh, the BBC or something. But, but he, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ringo's 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 the best, and uh, all of us drummers love him. Absolutely. Good for you, man. Let's talk a little bit about Steve Carley. How you 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 mentioned that a little bit. How you ended up meeting him, and uh, how did the the Cockney Rebel begin? Let's go back to the beginning. Ah, oh, that was another really strange encounter because uh, it was just put by pure chance that I I was I I was introduced to him instead of this other bass player who went into oblivion, didn't ever make a success of it. Um, but Steve, it, he'd already. Um, He'd already been working as a busker. He was like busking, you know, in uh, the tube stations and that's the right. Street. Yeah, outside the tube station. They, they... Yeah, he was he was busking with uh, John Crocker, the violinist. And they were sort of like playing together, and it was just those two at that stage. And they came round to my mum and dad's house, into my bedroom, and we just listened to some music, chatted, and I think John Crocker asked me what star sign I was, and um, within about an hour, they said, "Okay, you're in the band." Then they didn't hear me play. They didn't do any rehearsals or auditions or anything. They just liked me and uh, hoped for the best. Um, so wow. that all worked out. It worked out well. Yeah, it worked out well. Um, and of course, you know, we 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 made our first album, The Human Menagerie, which um, I didn't really think much of it at the time. You know, I th I just thought we weren't we were a bit ragged and not not that good. And uh, but when I listen to it now, I listen to it. Um, you know, objectively now rather than subjectively as I did then. And it's actually, it's actually my favorite album now because, um, mainly because of, of, well, Steve's vocal performance is, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with that album, but his vocal performance is just off the scale. I mean, it's in, in theatrics, you know, um, mm. and, and the band were a, a hot little passionate sort of energetic band as well. Um, and I like that. And, you know, I like to hear young musicians, passionate they don't have a lot of technique but they don't have a lot of um uh tuition or whatever but they just they just love making music and you can hear the passion and that's what we were like and i i feel that now from what we were like then and i in some ways i sort of i'm kind of listening to what i played on those records and i'm sort of not so much impressed with myself but i'm thinking oh that little thing that i did there I don't do that anymore. It's really good. I like that. You know, I'm going to start doing that again, you know? So I kind of learned from myself as a, you know, an older person looking at myself as when I was younger. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I, it's like another thing, you know, um, I used to have these two little tiny drums, concert toms, like six inch and 10 inch, uh, eight inch and 10 inch um, for many years. And I stopped using them about 30 years ago. And then when I heard one of the recordings I did with Steve, which has got the full range of those little little drums and big drums, I thought, oh, I really like that. So I've got I've got another set now. They're, they're in my studio now. So I'm 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 getting back into you know it's like <laughs> learning from you're sort of learning and uh, being influenced by myself, which is really weird. Um, so yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I'm glad that you able to listen to your old old stuff as well because many musicians that I have talked to they never do this. They know I did that album with whatever peter frampton and it's you know that was 30 years ago my my style is different i play different guitar or, or drums or piano whatever you you're playing and uh but you, in your case you you look back and you listen to your own stuff all stuff and, I, well no no i don't i don't listen to uh, i generally don't listen to my stuff but um yes. i have been just recently going back uh because i've had more yeah. time you know more time not not actually playing music um it just is a uh, well i had to i had to listen back to that album a little while back because we had to perform some of the songs again so i'd listen to them again okay. um, and and i realized you know that, that um how good an engineer jeff emmerich was for instance you know he, he engineered that first album and i 
I, you know, it's one of the best drum sounds that I think I've ever, ever gotten, you know, just, just an old fashioned drum sound a la, you know, Ringo or whatever. It's fat, tight, punchy, great sound. Um, so yeah, I, I don't generally, if I, if I, if I've just done an album with somebody, I don't like to listen to it straight away. Um, but it's good to come back to, to listening to things. It's only if they're really good songs, if it's a great song, um, you have to listen to it again because it's, it, 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 it's, you know, when I play on a great song, it inspires me to be better than, you know, better than I am really. Um, so it's nice to listen to yourself doing something that fits a great song and does it justice. So um, I listen a little bit back, but n not, not much. Yeah. Good for you, man. Good for you. How do you think uh, Alan Parsons influenced the band? I mean, he produced a huge, you know, hit. Um, Best year well, of Rebel. life. We had the number one hit, Make Me Smile. And unbelievable. Then, you know. Do you mean uh, Alan's influence on um, on Courtney Rebel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan was um, Alan was great to work with. Uh, he's a bit like George Martin, you know. That they're, they're, they're very mild, very quiet, mm -hmm. um, but they you know they make they make good suggestions. Um, you know, if, if something isn't quite working, they'll just suggest gently to sort of do it a slightly different way, a bit faster, a bit slower. Um, uh, and he's a good engineer, of course. You know, he used to get a lovely a lovely sound when we came back into the studio. You hear this sound, you think, oh, that's good. It sound, almost sounds like a record, you know, like a finished mix, you know. Correct. Whereas in a lot of sessions, they, they don't do that. They just sort of do it flat and dry, and, and then they make it all sparkle after, you know. Mm. Um but in those days, they had to mainly get a sound and put it onto tape. But Alan went even further with all the lovely reverbs and it'd make you sound sort of smooth and, and uh, expensive, you know. So he was good in that respect. Um, in fact, when I listened to the, the remastered version of Make Me Smile Now, it's just, oh, the, the sound quality. I've never listened to um, our old music in my studio, which I've got really good monitors and great headphones and everything. I used to just listen to it, uh, like in the living room, you know, on, on a, 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 a medium to low sort of grade hi-fi, but in the studio, I'm listening to, it, I think, wow, that's fabulous, fabulous, beautiful mix and everything. So he was, yeah, he was good in that respect. It's unbelievable that, I mean, from, you know, I'm not a musician, right? So I don't know how to play any instrument. I don't know how to read music, but I've been listening to music, I don't know, three hours a day from the last 50 years or so. And uh, it, it, Alan Parson, it's one of those people that are amazing. Even if he hasn't formed Alan Parson project or singing or just the recording engineer aspect of himself, it would have lived forever. I mean, it's an amazing that people can can be so good you know it's well the good the good thing about alan was he he has a he has a very um i suppose it's it's sort of etched in time i suppose it, it kind of comes from the 60s you know where the focus was always the vocal is the main focus that's yeah. that's got to be it's got to be clear and crystal clear up front and then the, the main instruments are kind of sort of a level below that and the drums would be below that. You know, they don't have to be like now you get the drums. It's like, <laughs> and then the vocals. Face, yeah. Whereas Alan's balance was always lovely. And he always got a beautiful um, sound from the bass drum. It was nice round sort of nice Ooh. thump, like a big heartbeat, you know, whereas now they can be <laughs> splat, you know. Um, so I like the way he balances music and it always brings out the best in everyone's performance. I mean, if you listen to, um, uh, one of the most lovely albums, one of the loveliest albums I ever played on was um, Year of the Cat, Al oh, Stewart. Sure. Sure. And you yeah. listen to just the sound quality and it's just like, it's just like smooth and like velvet, you know, it's just beautiful. Um, mm. uh, and the musicianship that's brought out because of that approach, it just comes up a notch because we're all inspired yeah. by what we, what we hear back, you know. So yeah, Al Alan was fantastic to work with in that respect. Yeah. Al Alan is very... I have met him a couple of times and uh, he's quite quiet. He's not very talkative, but he's very good at what he does. I mean, we'll tell you, you know, like you say, you know, yes, good, no, change this a little bit. Okay, next song and uh, no need to do another, you know, 10 tracks of the same version if, if it sounds good. That's and right. Yeah, yeah. 
he, he's very he, efficient in what he does you know he knows how to he knows how to listen he knows how to listen and yeah. what to listen for you know and uh, whereas us musicians will sort of listen to ourselves when we record and we say oh no i'm not sure can i do it again and he'll say no it's fine it's good it's good yeah. and then you go away and come back a few years later and you listen to it and you can't remember what you didn't like but you can't find what you didn't like you know so that's right it, it, yeah. It, it, yeah yeah and yeah. then uh after that well in between you you end up becoming a uh your career turned a little bit to the session player and uh and feel free and then you end up playing with al Seward for the famous famous year of the cat album you know how and time is flight yeah, and time and not time's flight um time time passages. Passages. Yeah. um yeah well my career my, my sessions career sort of overlapped cotney rebel i did yeah. um because uh, year of the cat was we were, I think we recorded it 75 and it was released 76 i think uh, and i was still in cockney rebel at that time uh, <coughs> i think the first the first real session that i did when we split up in 77 was the uh, kick inside with kate bush <coughs> that was the first major album that i recorded after cockney rebel split up and then that that's where that's where my session career started to sort of take off a bit you like doing that i mean you you prefer to or perhaps you don't have any choice playing with a particular band and then tour with the band to another record play with the band to another record tour or or it, you prefer to is is it fun to be a, a session player or difficult or um well it's it's all those it's, it's fun and it's difficult and sometimes it's a hell <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you got you. They might hire you to do a specific thing for a specific record, and you don't like the, you know, the producer. You you might not like the musician to begin with, but they give you good money to go and you know bite the bullet, so to speak, and play with them. That's exactly right. I go, I go home, you know. Forget That's exactly that. right. Yeah, I mean, I think if I if I if I look back on everything I ever did in the studio, um, I can only think of about four or five albums that were just unforgettable you know just uh, such yeah. an experience and such a magical um chemistry between everybody um there's such a rare thing to happen um and, you know for the for the rest of for the rest of the projects i did they'd be kind of okay um but then there was a few there was a few an, another sort of large handful that would have been I wish they'd never happened, you know, because they, when you get, you know, it's a strange thing, you know, because the happiest time for um, any creative person is when they do it just because they love it and they do it for the love. Um, but as soon as it, it has to be, you do it for money. Ooh. And then once you get, once you agree a, a fee for something, you have to do it, even though you don't like it. Yeah. It's sort of kind of ruins things a little bit, but uh, you kind of have to do it really. Yeah, sometimes you close and quite sure you close your eyes do in the studio and say what the heck i'm doing here man I well yeah there were a few cases there were a few times there I'm, were getting a few pay, times. I'm getting paid okay but i prefer to do something else <laughs> there were a few times when i got home and i just sort of collapsed on the bed and thought um i've had enough of this i'm not doing this anymore but i must yeah. have done that about a thousand times in the last 40 years but uh there's always something that keeps me going um even you know even like just before that i got that phone call just before this uh, our interview yeah i was bashing my drums having a great time you know that i do it every day i play my drums every day so there's something in me that won't give up you know so i have to just keep going and going and going for you man feel free to elaborate about you know the you know the year of the cat album play with al stewart uh and then time passages I mean, both were produced by Alan Parson again, and feel free to right. tell me what you remember about. I mean, I believe I remember I was living in in South America, listening to the the Year of the Cat, and now I'm talking to you, the you know the drummer for all this. I'm amazing, man. I'm you. You don't know how happy I am talking to you, man. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. What you recall about the session and play with old Stewart and um, what I recall, I just recall it being really. It, like one of those albums you know where i said where the where the chemistry between yeah. the band the, all the musicians and the producer it was just it was perfect from the word go i think i you know i was very young and i was very confident at that time um i didn't have um i i, I developed a sort of um 
uh, not so much a fear, but more of a critic being critical of my own playing over the years. As the more I, the more sessions that I did. But when I when I did um, Year of the Cat, I was I was just I had a lot of freedom in my playing, and because uh, I was in Cockney Rebel, which was a very free experience, you know, very free band. Um, and of course, being in in the in the seventies, there was no click tracks, there was no machines, so that the you know it was it was something that you could put in a performance without worrying about whether you're in with a yeah. click, um, which sort of kind of ruined things for me for many years when they first started throwing clicks at me, um, because the best tracks I ever played on were done live, you know, with no no machines, no no, no clicks. Um, and when I listen to those grooves, they are just smoother and make you feel um, more like you want to move than all the rigid things that I did later with click tracks. Um, so, yeah, so the the, uh, the Year of the Cat, I think the first track we did, and I found this out actually just a couple of weeks ago. I, I, uh, Al, Al Stewart was in, was in London doing some shows with, you know, he's got this new band, The Empty Pockets. All right. Yeah. Um, they invited me down to um, to come to see the show and to come and come up and play. You know, and uh, when Al uh, asked me to, so I came to the show and um, and Al sort of effect for the last number. Al says Stuart Elliott in the room, and then I stand up and went on the stage and we played Year of the Cat together. Um, right. And it was uh, Peter White was there as well. You know, the guy that um, was on the Year of the Cat album. Um, the guy that co-wrote Time Passages with, with Al, um, he was there and he, he was telling his little stories and uh, they played um, Flying Sorcery, you know, that track. Mm -hmm. And he said this was the first track we recorded at Abbey Road Studio 2 back in 1975 or 76. Yeah. So that that was the first track I ever played on. And that's one of my favorite tracks I ever played on. Yeah. It's just something about it. There's just something magical about it that um, that the way the band just came together on that first day and it was like from there on it was just it just just it was plain sailing you know the first track was down and it sounded great and way hey, we're all we're all ready to go um and i remember um when we finished year of the cat we did uh, one of the one of the days we did the sessions was a bank holiday monday which is about a public holiday uh, for which you get double session fees oh, wow. and i thought oh lovely T twice as much money and then exactly a year later, we did one day session on a bank holiday Monday to do one more track called, I think it was called Bell Size Park Blues or something, which was not a very good track. And it didn't make the album, and I'm glad it didn't, but it, it, it's, it became a, a bonus track for other things. Um, but that was supposed to be the culmination of the Year of the Cat. But Year of the Cat had already been finished, so they just left it as it was. Um, but it, no, it was it was pure magic playing that uh, playing on that album. I have to say, um, I don't remember any specific things or, or things that anyone said or did it. It's I just I guess I have pictures now, like pictures of that room and where I was sitting and wow. Where, and Al and Pete with their acoustic guitars in a booth, you know, so we didn't spill the drums onto them. Um, and and the thing the thing about it was that there were such good musicians, um, and I, I don't think I'd played with so many good musicians at one time. Wow! It was just you know, Tim Rennick, you know, the guitarist. My God! I mean, you you listen to the guitar on Year of the Cat, and it's it's just out yeah. oh it's out there it's just like you know he was way ahead of i i, I was like a caveman compared to him um <laughs> but you know but sometimes you know but but it, it's al's manager told me that um it was me that made the album it was he thought That's it was me it, my drumming that made the album but i, I wouldn't say that i think it was a, it was a culmination of everybody just doing the right thing at the right time um and excelling at, at on what was really beautifully written, fantastic songs. Yeah, there, there isn't a bad song on that album. They're, they're just they're all fantastic. Yeah. All fantastic. I'm, I'm happy that you guys, in the case of Al Stewart, you know, still get along well. There's some band that you play, or they break up. They don't want to see one another. It, it's great that you you know with some with some musicians, right? You can 
still be friends, get along, you know. Yeah. You move on in your life, but still call you back and you still have, you know, another 10 minutes of fame, if you will, playing in the band with the, the guy you recorded, you know, for 50 years ago, or whatever. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's lovely. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long may it last. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. Um, and then uh, tell me now how you end up you know meeting kate bush to to begin with and uh, never mind playing with her and but uh, feel free to elaborate on how you end up getting into the album the kick inside and so forth so. right okay uh, i think i might have said something about that earlier um you know i said that on the first two courtney rebel albums andrew yeah. powell andrew yeah. powell yeah. orchestral yeah. arranger played on yeah. on my suit and um it was andrew that produced those first two albums of Kate's, he yep. produced. He, he was a producer, so he asked me to, to do the sessions. So that's how I got. That's how I got the 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 the, the this the uh, the gig with Kate. Yeah, it was Andrew Powell. Yeah, she she's an amazing lady. I mean, I I look back in her career. It's like the Alan Parsons in the music industry. In my opinion, every record was so different, and it was way ahead of the time. Yeah, she she really know what she wanted to do, and you were not in all the track in every album. Sometimes she was using, uh, you know, in a studio like 10, 15 people, and I want you to play this track and that track, and you think that some people can have a vision. It's I don't know. I think you you are born with it or you are not. I mean, it's amazing how unbelievable, you know, she is or was, you know. So. Well, when we actually when we went into the studio, she had already written all of her songs, and so really? and she and yes, they're all written. They're, they're, they're all that she'd written them years before. Um, in fact, she when she she's, I think she wrote most of the songs when she was sixteen, and we recorded them when she was nineteen. Correct. Yeah. I think Wuthering Heights. She may have written that closer to when we did the sessions, but um, she played them on a the piano. She'd sit at the grand piano and she would play the song and sing the song. So all we had to do was just listen to the song, look at the chord chart, clock what she was singing, and just play along. I mean, that's it was so easy. It's a bit like, you know, Elton John, he does, it is a full performance on the piano and the vocal. It, it, it's um, all you have to do is listen Ooh. and respond. Um, it's not like it didn't start off and then she sang it later. She sang it live in the studio with us. Amazing, man. It was fantastic. Oh. How old were you at the time when you were playing the gig inside when you recorded? Uh, I think I was 24. She was 19, and I'm about five years older than her, I think. My God, young young guy, man. <laughs> Play with yeah, all yeah, yeah. And I was, yeah, I was, um, uh, it was a magic time, actually. It was a magic time. I felt a magical air about, that was one of the albums. You know, I said there was only about four or five albums that were magical. That was one yeah. of them. Uh, a year of the cat was another lenny zakatek's album was one which one you know one was the do it right and uh oh, yeah, 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 yeah. a and m that, that that was a that was a magic experience with some fantastic yeah. musicians and lenny's yeah. amazing vocal um there are others pyramid uh, alan parsons yeah, pyramid yeah 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 and i think my first album with cotton rebel that was just because we were young and excited and we just played we just went in and played the songs we We've been we've been rehearsing them and playing them on live for for months. So we just all we did was play them, and that was it. Can I just go and get a glass of water? Of course, yeah. We'll post it, post it. And uh, so the the first album, of course, uh, the Kick Inside did very well. At the time, you knew that you will be. She was uh, she was in tour at the time, but you knew that you will come back and play with the third and second and fourth and fifth album with her. I mean, the chemistry no. was great or, or you, or you went home and say, man, that was a great evening. She's a young, nice lady with a beautiful boy, but hey, make, nothing may happen. On I've, well, um, I never really make those kind of judgments. Uh, uh, I never made any of those kinds of judgments when I sort of recorded with anybody. Yeah. Um, I always just I'd always assume that that was it. Yeah, uh, they might not be a hit. They might be a hit. You don't know. Um, yeah. Um, 
in terms of being asked back, um, I never expected to be asked back. I mean, but Kate did ask me back for about, I think it was eight albums after that. Correct. Um, <laughs> Amazing. But she did use other drummers. I mean, she didn't ask me back automatically as the first choice every time. Um, yeah. Sometimes it was. And she, she just had, I think Kate, the thing about Kate is she's very, um, I don't know if mercurial is the right word, but she, she's always, she's always changing. There's, she's not a static, you know, Oh, I've got a drummer or I've got this. She's got a whole, she's got a whole, um, team of people that she's worked with over the years that she sort of cherry picks them for this and for that. And you never know what you're going to be asked to do. Um, I'm just thank my lucky stars that I got to play on the ones that I did get to play on, you know, like, um, Wuthering Heights, um, Babushka, Breathing, um, and there's a bunch of album tracks as well. But it was really, really an honour to be part of really great songs that were hit singles as well. It's, it's luck of the draw, you know, you, you don't know which track you're going to be asked to do. Correct. The, 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 the key Bush music is in many ways from, not from a drummer point of view, from my point of view, right? And, um, they are very complex, very difficult to be a, a musician playing those. So now for you, for your point of view as a drummer, they are in many ways atypical in their structure. You know, how you define the, the drum arrangement? Uh, and, um, well, it was kind of easy. It was easy in the, the first two albums because we played live. Yeah. Um, it got more difficult as when Kate became the producer and she pre-recorded her parts and her vocals and then she would get one person at a time to come in and play on them. Um, then it was a question of her, her listening to you while you're playing rather than listening to herself and performing. She's more sort of microscopic about what you're playing or what I was playing. Um, so that kind of slowed the process down a bit. Um, and it kind of gave birth to a different kind of music, uh, a, kind, a kind of music that doesn't, it doesn't um, organically evolve because once something is on tape, that's it, you know, that you have to play to that, you know, whereas if it's a live person, they will, you know, it's like sand going through a glass. It sort of falls its way. Then it find they find their way through, you know, and that's how, that's how it's uh, like a band of musicians is. They, they make little tiny adjustments here, there and everywhere without knowing it. And then all of a sudden you listen to a take and you think, Oh, that's, that's a fantastic take, but that, that one earlier was not very good, you know? Mm. Um, and it's about listening, but w when you're playing to a track that is set, it's it's kind of more rigid because then there would be click tracks and pulses to play to or um or lin drums or fair light patterns and things which makes it more machine like um so in a lot of ways i actually uh, I, I preferred making the light the first two albums which were live because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. more it's more organic and it's it's uh it's freer you know you have more freedom you can you can pull and push and just sort of it's more fluid you know um I can't remember what point I was going to make. I said, well, what was the original question? I forgot now. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, the, the, the drum arrangement and their, that you bring into a song, they, they were very complex. And I say to you, oh, that, right, yeah. you know, it's Kate, Kate Bush's um, music in general, right? From a, from a consumer point of view, from my point of view, I listen to a lot of stuff. It's very complex. Never mind for a musician like yourself performing this stuff. I mean, yeah it is complex it's um it's not technically complex it's just the arrangements are not what you expect it's right. like if you if someone plays a song a regular type song you know kind of know what's coming next don't you Correct. you know if it's a verse if it's an intro you think was well, a verse coming and then the verse is a certain feeling you think oh i can feel the bridge coming now there it is oh now I, yeah the chorus is just about to hit there it is bang on you and you always know where it's going to happen but right. with cake's music you can forget about uh, trying to guess what, what's going to happen next because she has this this thing of um i don't I, I wouldn't like to say i know exactly how she does it but I, I would i would think that she's got this um thing where she'll play the piano and she'll be sort of singing her lyrics and the lyrics sometimes dictate what time signature it is um or, or you know what you know like a given but it's like wuthering heights for instance was uh 
the chorus was five four. Two bars of five. I think it's think it's two bars of five four and a bar of two four or three four. I can't remember. I'd have to I'd have to count it again. But that's because of the lyric. Yeah. You know, where I had to sort of instead of just playing a, a, a steady offbeat, I had to sort of add a beat and then bring it into a different place. Judged, you know, by the way I felt whether it was she was on, you know, on an upbeat or a downbeat. But it was the lyrics that made say that it's it's got to be a five four bar, otherwise the lyric doesn't work. So that's how she that's how she works. She'll sing a lyric and she'll you know she'll sing it till it needs to end, and whatever the time signature happens to be, that's what it is. You know whether it's a five or it's a six or it's a seven. And then the second time it repeats, it'll be a different lyric, and then it won't have that time signature change. So you've got you've got to listen for um, you know where she's going, and sometimes you know, well, not sometimes, all the time when she'd already written something, I'd have to make some notes, you know, write some notes down and the time signatures, and say, well, this is a, this is this length, this is eight bars. Now it's nine bars, and then it's ten bars, and it's like. <laughs> It's uh, it's not something you can just come and jam on like we did, like we did in the first albums, which you just play, you listen and play. Right. Um, yeah. It's, it's more more complex, more complicated. It's amazing that. that that people can. First of all, talking about Jay K. Bush, she she re, she wrote all this unbelievable song when she was like you mentioned, fifteen, sixteen years old, and then after the first two year two records, she. She became her own producer. It's, it, it's amazing that people had that ability at that early life. She would have been 19, 20 or whatever, being producer yeah. of her own music and trusting her instinct. Don't hire any people who would been around for a long time at the time, in the 40s or whatever. Tell her what to do. No, you know, I know what I'm doing. And, and, and Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, nobody... I'm, Nobody tells Kate what to do. My God, I mean, she is she's one of the gentlest, sort of sweetest people you will ever meet. I mean, she's so so yeah. sweet and, and um, calm and uh, patient, but she's resolved. <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't make a suggestion. I think we did as younger musicians. We try and make suggestions, and she smile and just you know just can't get just quietly ignore you. Like. <laughs> So we we learned very fast that you don't you don't you don't nobody tells Kate what, what she to do. should be doing. No, 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 no. She doesn't no. work that way. No. She, she wouldn't say no, she has to look at you and say or smile. She has to yeah, she has to do it the way she has to do it. Um and you can't argue with, with, with the outcome because everything she everything she's recorded is just stunning. You know, it's just um it may it may not be the way that we as musicians would have performed it, but she got what she wanted out of each musician um, right. because of the fact that she was she had a more microscopic view as as the producer, you know, behind the glass. Um, she would we would discuss the parts, and then she would say what she did like, what she didn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when we did a kick inside and um, and uh, Lionheart. She didn't make any comments about anything. She just played the songs. We played them. Producer said yes or no. Um, so in in that way, I think she was slightly more compliant and manipulated because she was young and just learning. But she learned real fast. I have to say, she learned so quickly that she was. Uh, I think she'd had it planned what was how, how it was going to develop. You know, she would she would see what was going on, um, and then drop the producer and then she co-produced the third album with john kelly who was our engineer so she got a more of a feel for the production by using him as a co-producer so they so split it to two you know two producers and then after that she did it solo because she she'd learned enough from those three experiences that she could do it herself and she even went further than that she she um set up her own studio which not many people did in those days she bought all the gear, bought the desk, bought the multi-track tape machines, and she set up a lovely little studio at her dad's, mum and dad's house, which was a farm, farmhouse. Oh, yeah. And it had a big barn, and she, she converted this barn to a beautiful little studio, and she made Hounds of Love there. Oh, my God. What a, yeah, I never, I have never seen Kate Bush playing live. Of course, never had met her. Probably will never have the opportunity to interview her but it's someone that i really really admire and uh 
Yeah, she's an amazing player. What do you recall yeah. about running running up the hill? What do I recall? Yeah. Or um, well, I remember she sent me, uh, which is very rare for Kate to do. Well, if she never did it ever, she sent me a cassette. Oh, really? Of the, yeah. of, of the starting point, which yeah. was a drum machine. It was a drum machine. Um, and the song was there. It was all finished. Um, the song was finished. We you know, with some, a little bit of keyboards and some vocals. Um, so I had, to, I had to come in and replace the drums. And in, in sort of attempting to do so, um, we ended up um, actually keeping the the program toms because of the sound. It, they got so used to that that sound of those toms and the and the incessant sort of drive that um, programmed drums have. They kept that, and I played uh, I played the real drums over the top, um, and then I played the big fills in in the, you know the big explosions and the fills in um, the middle, mm. and that was it really. Um, and then uh, I was quite surprised she sent me the cassette because I knew she was very private and very, very suspicious that stuff like that gets out and people bootleg it and sell it and stuff. And she asked, she asked for it back. And I, I said, yeah, I've got it. Yeah. So I gave it back to her. <laughs> so I no longer have that copy. Um, but it was, it was just one, one, one track amongst many on uh, Hounds of Love, which was... Uh, Ooh, that great, yeah. Which, you know, um, as musicians, you know, I'd do some tracks. Charlie Morgan did some tracks. Um, and we'd be uh, just in the dark as to what the album was going to be. But especially the, the Ninth Wave, you know, that side of the album. Who would have known that it was going to be such a such an epic piece of um, orchestral and, uh, oh, I don't know, it's just like, a, it's like painting a huge painting, wasn't it? I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable piece of music. <laughs> you know transitioning from one track to another as a as a whole sort of theme um yeah it was an absolute masterpiece that i, I don't know how the hell she envisaged it and whether it whether it just came to be together bit by bit but i think that it's definitely recognized as her best album isn't it oh yeah and if you from a commercial point of view right that album and, and that track um right up the hill or uh, whether in height or Bakush or cloud bursting, some of the the ones that I recall are I have been streamed millions of times, mm -hmm. billions of times all over the world. Like I don't I don't know if you have any you receive any royalties, but Kate Bush is you know uh, with all her rights, very rich person. She you know, yeah to to come back and tour or play or I mean there are you know. I don't know, out of hidden somewhere, you know, they don't want to play anymore. They don't have to play anymore. If they do, it's because they love the music. It's amazing. That, yeah, I think I think Kate, in an ideal world, Kate just likes to be quiet and private and record, record her music like an artist painting a painting. You know, she doesn't, I don't think she really wants to go out playing live. Um, she did, she did that one time back in 2014. Um, yeah, thank you. But um, you know, it's very unlike her. Um, and uh, everyone kept asking me, you know, when Running Up That Hill became a big hit, they said, yeah. do you think Kate will start to come out and tour now? I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure she won't. <laughs> she's not like it. She's not an opportunity. Uh, uh, sorry, an opportunist like that. She would just, she'll do things when, when there's a, a good reason to do it or she wants to do it, but not out of opportunism. She won't, uh, doesn't go for that. Yeah, I, as I say before, I I never seen her, and I think uh, the the show that you re referred to, I think it was um, I don't know ten to fifteen nine. The ticket went like that, and then she disappeared again. It's uh, you know. It's, yeah, I couldn't I I couldn't get a ticket initially because I I'd sort of lost contact with Kate at that point. Yeah. Um, but her um, her ex boyfriend and bass player and engineer Del Palmer. I yeah. still had his number, so I, I I asked him if if you know if 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 he knew where I could get some tickets, and so he asked Kate, and she got me two tickets, and I got in to see the show. So yeah, so I got in just just scraped my way in. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, shortly after, you end up replacing Stuart Tosh in the Alan Parson project. You know how how tell us about how you end up joining the band and from Pyramid and so forth. Ah, uh, yeah, that was um, that was an that was as a result of having um, played the kick inside. Mm -hmm. 
those sessions, those sessions is where I met Ian Benson and yeah. David Payton from Pilot. Yeah, they were Kate, they were in Kate Kate's band then. Um, not not sorry, not in her band. We were on the sessions, um, and when we finished that album, they um, they told me that um, they really. It's the first time we played. And actually, no, I played with Ian many years ago, but it was the first time we played an album together as as musicians, and um, they both really liked my playing and they said oh alan's uh, stuart stuart's leaving the band uh, stuart's leaving the sorry he's not leaving he's joining 10 cc and he won't be able to do the project anymore so we'll put a word in for you we'll ask alan if he can just use you and i knew alan anyway so that was a done deal i just said oh yeah okay in you come so that that started that off and um I think the first album we did there was pyramid well they they dave uh Peter told me also that you guys get along very well they were a very tight crew and uh, good good uh chemistry oh great, yeah great, a lot of you and uh it was great sometimes you don't see that in bands you know you yeah. but in your in that particular period of your time uh, david they paid and told me that you guys get on very well there was easy going very professional but they it was good good chemistry about all of you you know oh yeah we used to have a laugh as well because um ian and david are are, are both scottish correct yeah and yeah. they were very close they were very close it was always just the two of them that going everywhere together you know and I, I used to sort of i used to tag along i, I always felt like they're a bit like the odd man out because they were doing all their scottish accents and their silly jokes and everything so i started doing the same thing so we, we all became scottish <laughs> overnight you know yeah. um oh what a laugh though such i mean fantastic musicians i mean david is one of the one of the best bass players i ever played with well, yeah. okay, he's the only one um, who I could um, safely say was played bass more like Paul McCartney. Really? Yeah. You know, yeah. like that um, melodic sort of a lot of uh, playing up the top of the scale and high up and then down and then just melodic, you know, it's like because uh, he's a songwriter as well. Um, I used to love his playing. Beautiful, Ooh. beautiful, beautiful bass playing. How was uh, Eric Wolfson to, to be with and follow direction from him or the interaction with him oh eric. i never i never met him and uh, of course i know who he is and oh eric was well we, we we really liked eric he was he was fun but no no he wasn't fun but we used to make fun of him um because he was very serious he was very serious he was very tall he was about six foot six wow um, and he spoke to us as if he was like our headmaster really yeah he, he, he always called me elliot elliot or benson Peyton, you know, it was our surnames, you know, for our last name. <laughs> really? No, my first name? Oh, yeah, my. it was funny. Yeah, very, very, very sort of um, very serious. But he could have a laugh as well. It was it was a, it was a really interesting character, actually. Um, and of course, a, a, an incredible, incredible songwriter. Um, but yeah, we used to have fun. We used to have fun. We, we used to take the mickey out of him and uh, and but he wouldn't smile, you know, because it was always very, very, very serious looking. But it was all in good spirits. There was no, there was no, uh, there was no cynicism or nastiness. But um, he, he, he was a great, he was a great uh, part of the team. In fact, a very important part of the team because he wrote so, so many of the songs. But um, yeah, yeah he, he was, he was a good character. Yeah, I'm surprised that you know when when Alan Parson began doing, you know, keep took the head of a producer and began writing song and then touring and doing doing the project that the band wasn't called i don't know alan parson and and, uh, and himself i mean alan parson with with walson or, or you know walson parson project or whatever i mean in, i don't know i think maybe alan parson was more well known at the time when they asked him what what's the name of of the band's going to be and other person say well other person um, that's my first and last name but i'm surprised um, that, you know the wilson name last name didn't come along with with them well no i i think it was eric's eric's idea to call it the alan parsons project really? um but yeah because he, he he i think eric regarded himself as a as a writer but um a creator but maybe not as as an artist or performer um and a manager he was a manager as well um 
but it was also the fact that um, uh, Alan had was making a name as a as a hit producer, uh, and he also um, engineered and mixed Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. Well, yeah. So that's I think that's what Eric wanted for his music. He wanted that that status and the pedigree of Alan producing and engineering his music. So he gave it Alan's name. Um, but I will say that he did regret doing that. You know, he was, um, if you look, if you, um, if you listen to the song Limelight from this thing, was it from Stereotomy or Gaudi? I can't remember. But um, that's it. poor old Eric. <laughs> so, that's all he ever wanted was the limelight from uh, since it all began. Um, because he didn't really get the record. I don't think because it was called the Alan Parsons Project, Alan was obviously getting all the attention on interviews and everything. And I think he realised that he perhaps made a bit of a mistake for himself. But, um, it, you know, it's all water on the bridge, you know, can't can't change history. Um, and they were both very successful as a result of it. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. What you recall about the one of my favourite track in, in the lab, of the gods, if you can, uh, if you can recall anything about that track or that I'm album, just, I'm just trying to recall it. I can't think of anything memorable that you can. The map of the gods, isn't that isn't that an instrumental? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful place, man. I I'm can't I can't. Um... You're blind. Yeah. Yeah. Can you play it? <laughs> Uh, I will need to look it up in Spotify and. But, 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 no, no, let me no, no, hold on. Let me just let me find it on. Uh, if you have it, if you can recall, that would be. I'll find. I'll find it on YouTube. Hold on. Yeah. I just. I just need to remember exactly what the track is. Yeah. In the lap. Yeah, in the lap of the gods. Well, there's a few tracks called that. In the lap of the cops, Koba, Alan Parson, probably you will find it. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. I'll probably get, get an advert now, but uh, never mind. Oh, there it is. Uh, the lap of the gods. This new Just wait for this ad to pass. That's right. <laughs> there we go. Someone's died. No, hang on, hang on. Oh, did it? Yeah, did it. There's no drums. <laughs> no, but it's a beautiful piece, man. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, it's, uh, Alan was so good at writing instrumentals. I have to say, people think it's it's easy. I always there's no lyrics, don't have to think of any lyrics. But um, his his uh, instrumentals were always spot on. I mean, seriously, I think Sirius is the most in, um, successful track of, of of all because it got used for the Chicago Bulls. So it's the. It was only a little short piece, but it's, it was uh, really, really, really successful. Yeah, that, that track, like you mentioned. Puff Daddy used it as well. He sampled it. That's right. It, he had been used with the Chicago Bulls, commercials, malls, supermarkets, elevators, everywhere, man. It's, uh, like, yeah, you know, I know. I know. I know. It was like a, one of the Kate Bush's, you know, track that. Going to be played forever, you know, so it's...